chapter one of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter one preface and a few preliminary remarks this is not a cookery book it makes no attempt to replace a good one it is rather an effort to fill up the gap between you and your household oracle whether she be one of those exasperating old friends who maddened our mother with their vagueness or the newer and better lights of our own generation the latest and best of all being a lady as well known for her novels as for her works on domestic economy one more proof if proof were needed of the truth i endeavour to set forth if somewhat tediously forgive me in this little book that cooking and cultivation are by no means antagonistic who does not remember with affectionate admiration charlotte bronte taking the eyes out of the potatoes stealthily for fear of hurting the feelings of her purblind old servant or margaret fuller shelling peas the chief difficulty i fancy with women trying recipes is that they fail and know not why they fail and so become discouraged and this is where i hope to step in but although this is not a cookery book insomuch as it does not deal chiefly with recipes i shall yet give a few but only when they are or i believe them to be better than those in general use or good things little known or supposed to belong to the domain of a french chef of which i have introduced a good many should i succeed in making things that were obscure before clear to a few women i shall be as proud as was mademoiselle de genlis when she boasts in her memoirs that she has taught six new dishes to a german housewife six new dishes when brulat savarin says he who has invented one new dish has done more for the pleasure of mankind than he who has discovered a star chapter one a few preliminary remarks alexandra dumas pere after writing five hundred novels says i wish to close my literary career with a book on cooking and in the hundred pages or so of preface or perhaps overture would be the better word since in it a group of literary men while contributing recondite recipes flourish trumpets in every key to his huge volume he says i wish to be read by people of the world and practised by people of the art jean de l'art and although i wish like every one who writes to be read by all the world i wish to aid the practice not of the professors of the culinary art but those whose aspirations point to an enjoyment of the good things of life but whose means of attaining them are limited there is a great deal of talk now about cooking in a lesser degree it takes its place as a popular topic with ceramics modern antiques and household art the fact of it being in a mild way fashionable may do a little good to the eating world in general and it may make it more easy to convince young women of refined proclivities that the art of cooking is not beneath their attention to know that the queen of england's daughters and of course the cream of the london fair have attended the lectures on the subject delivered at south kensington and that a young lady of rank sir james cole's daughter has been recording angel to the association is in fact the r c c who edits the official handbook of cookery but notwithstanding all that has been done by south kensington lectures in london and miss corson's cooking school in new york to popularize the culinary art one may go into a dozen houses and find the ladies of the family with sticky fingers scissors and gum pot busily porcelainizing clay jars and not find one where they are as zealously trying to work out the problems of the official handbook of cookery i have nothing to say against the artistic distractions of the day anything that will induce love of the beautiful and remove from us the possibility of a return to the horrors of haircloth and brocatel and crochet tidies will be astride in the right direction but what i do protest against is the fact that the same refined girls and matrons who so love to adorn their houses 
that they will spend hours improving a pickle jar medievalizing their furniture or decorating the dinner service will shirk everything that pertains to the preparation of food as dirty disagreeable drudgery and sit down to a commonplace ill-prepared meal served on those artistic plates as complacently as if dainty food were not a refinement as if heavy rolls and poor bread burnt or greasy steak and wilted potatoes did not smack of the shanty just as loudly as coarse crockery or rag carpet indeed far more so the carpet and crockery may be due to poverty but a dainty meal or its reverse will speak volumes for innate refinement or its lack in the woman who serves it you see by my speaking of rag carpets and dainty meals in one breath that i do not consider good things to be the privilege of the rich alone there are a great many dainty things the household of small or moderate means can have just as easily as the most wealthy beautiful bread light white crisp costs no more than the tough thick crusted boulder with cavities like eye sockets that one so frequently meets with as homemade bread as hood says who has not met with homemade bread a heavy compound of putty and lead delicious coffee is only a matter of care not expense and indeed in america the cause of poor food even in a boarding-house is seldom in the quality of the articles so much as in the preparation and selection of them yet an epicure can breakfast well with fine bread and butter and good coffee and this leads me to another thing many people think that to give too much attention to food shows gluttony i have heard a lady say with a tone of virtuous rebuke when the conversation turned from fashions to cooking i give very little time to cooking we eat to live only which is exactly what an animal does eating to live is mere feeding brulat savarin an abstemious eater himself among other witty things on the same topic says l'animal se repay l'homme mange l'homme d'esprit sur ses manger nine people out of ten when they call a man an epicure mean it as a sort of reproach a man who is averse to everyday food one whom plain fare would fail to satisfy but grimaud de la reyniere the most celebrated gourmet of his day author of almanac des gourmands an authority on all matters culinary of the last century said a true epicure can dine well on one dish provided it is excellent of its kind excellent that is it a little care will generally secure to us the refinement of having only on the table what is excellent of its kind if it is but potatoes and salt let the salt be ground fine and the potatoes white and mealy thackeray says an epicure is one who never tires of brown bread and fresh butter and in this sense every new yorker who has his rolls from the brevoort house and uses darlington butter is an epicure there seems to me more mere animalism in wading through a long bill of fare eating three or four indifferently cooked vegetables fish meat poultry each second-rate in quality or made so by bad cooking and declaring that you have dined well and are easy to please than there is in taking pains to have a perfectly broiled chop a fine potato and a salad on which any true epicure could dine well while on the former fare he would leave the table hungry spencer points a moral for me when he says speaking of the irish in fifteen eighty that wherever they found a plot of shamrocks or watercresses they had a feast but there were gourmets even among them for some gobbled the green food as it came and some picked the faultless stalks and looked for the bloom on the leaf thus it is when i speak of good living i do not mean expensive living or high living but living so that the table may be as elegant as the dishes on which it is served i believe there exists a feeling not often expressed perhaps but prevalent among young people that for a lady to cook with her own hands is vulgar to love to do it shows that she is of low intellectual calibre a sort of drawing-room bridget when or how this idea arose it would be difficult to say for in the middle ages cooks were often noble a montmorency was chef de cuisine to philip of valois montesquieu descended 
and was not ashamed of his descent from the second cook of the connetable de bourbon who ennobled him and from lord bacon brightest greatest meanest of mankind who took it is said great interest in cooking to talleyrand the machiavelli of france who spent an hour every day with his cook we find great men delighting in the art as a recreation it is surprising that such an essentially artistic people as americans should so neglect an art which a great french writer calls the science mignon of all distinguished men of the world napoleon the great so fully recognized the social value of keeping a good table that although no gourmet himself he wished all his chief functionaries to be so keep a good table he told them if you get into debt for it i will pay and later one of his most devoted adherents the marquis de coucy out of favour with louis the eighteenth on account of that very devotion found his reputation as a gourmet very serviceable to him a friend applied for a place at court for him which louis refused till he heard that m de coucy had invented the mixture of cream strawberries and champagne when he granted the petition at once nor is this a solitary instance in history where culinary skill has been a passport to fortune to its possessor savarin relates that the chevalier d'aubigny exiled from france was in london in utter poverty notwithstanding which by chance he was invited to dine at a tavern frequented by the young bucks of that day after he had finished his dinner a party of young gentlemen who had been observing him from their table sent one of their number with many apologies and excuses to beg of him as a son of a nation renowned for their salads to be kind enough to mix theirs for them he complied and while occupied in making the salad told them frankly his story and did not hide his poverty one of the gentlemen as they parted slipped a five-pound note into his hand and his need of it was so great that he did not obey the prompting of his pride but accepted it a few days later he was sent for to a great house and learned on his arrival that the young gentleman he had obliged at the tavern had spoken so highly of his salad that they begged him to do the same thing again a very handsome sum was tendered him on his departure and afterwards he had frequent calls on his skill until it became the fashion to have salads prepared by d'aubigny who became a well-known character in london and was called the fashionable salad maker in a few years he amassed a large fortune by this means and was in such request that his carriage would drive from house to house carrying him and his various condiments for he took with him everything that could give variety to his concoctions from one place where his services were needed to another the contempt for this art of cooking is confined to this country and to the lower middle classes in england by the lower middle classes i mean what carlyle terms the geography i e people sufficiently well to do to keep a gig or phaeton well to do tradesmen small professional men the class whose womankind would call themselves genteel and many absurd stories are told of the determined ignorance and pretense of these would-be ladies but in no class above this is a knowledge of cooking a thing to be ashamed of in england indeed so far from that being the case indifference to the subject or lack of understanding and taste for certain dishes is looked upon as a sort of proof of want of breeding not to like curry macaroni or parmesan pate de foie gras mushrooms and such like is a sign that you have not been all your life accustomed to good living mr hardy in his pair of blue eyes cleverly hits this prejudice when he makes mr swancourt say i knew the fellow wasn't a gentleman he had no acquired tastes never took worcestershire sauce abroad many women of high rank and culture devote a good deal of time to a thorough understanding of the subject we have a lady of the lordly line of proud st clair writing for us dainty dishes and doing it with a zest that shows she enjoys her work although she does once in a while forget something she ought to have mentioned and later still we have miss rose coles writing the official handbook of cookery but it is in graceful refined france 
that cookery is and has been a pet art any bill of fare or french cookery book will betray to a thoughtful reader the attention given to the subject by the wittiest gayest and most beautiful women and the greatest men the high-sounding names attached to french standard dishes are no mere caprice or homage of a french cook to the great in the land but actually point out their inventor thus bechamel was invented by the marquis de bechamel as a sauce for codfish where filet de lapereau a la berry were invented by the duchess de berry daughter of the regent orleans who himself invented pen a la d'orleans while to richelieu we are indebted for hundreds of dishes besides the renowned mayonnaise caille a la mirepoix chartreuse a la moconseil poulet a la villeroy betray the tastes of the three great ladies whose name they bear but not in courts alone has the art had its devotees almost every great name in french literature brings to mind something its owner said or did about cooking dumas who was a prince of cooks and of whom it is related that in eighteen sixty when living at varennes st mar dividing his time as usual between cooking and literature lorsqu'il ne faisait pas sauter un roman il faisait sauter des petites oignons on mount joy a young artist friend and neighbor going to see him he cooked dinner for him going into the poultry yard after donning a white apron he wrung the neck of a chicken then to the kitchen garden for vegetables which he peeled and washed himself lit the fire got butter and flour ready put on his saucepans then cooked stirred tasted seasoned until dinner time then he entered in triumph and announced le dîner est servi for six months he passed three or four days a week cooking for montjoy this novelist book says in connection with the fact that great cooks in france have been men of literary culture and literary men often fine cooks it is not surprising that literary men have always formed the entourage of a great chef for to appreciate thoroughly all there is in the culinary art none are so well able as men of letters accustomed as they are to all refinements they can appreciate better than others those of the table thus paying himself and confrere a delicate little compliment at the expense of the non-literary world but notwithstanding the naive self-glorification he states a fact that helps to point my moral that indifference to cooking does not indicate refinement intellect or social preeminence brillat savarin grave judge as he was an abstemious eater yet has written the book of books on the art of eating it was he who said tell me what you eat i will tell you what you are as pregnant with truth as the better known proverb it paraphrases malherbe loved to watch his cook at work i think it was he who said a coarse-minded man could never be a cook and charles baudelaire the poe of france takes a poet's view of our daily wants when he says that an ideal cook must have a great deal of the poet's nature combining something of the voluptuary with the man of science learned in the chemical principles of matter although he goes farther than we care to follow when he says that the question of sauces and seasoning requires a chapter as grave as a feuilleton de science it has been said by foreigners that americans care nothing for the refinements of the table but i think they do care i have known many a woman in comfortable circumstances long to have a good table many a man aspire to better things and if he could only get them at home would pay any money but the getting them at home is the difficulty on a table covered with exquisite linen glass and silver whose presiding queen is more likely than not a type of the american lady graceful refined and witty on such a table with such surroundings will come the plentiful coarse commonplace dinner the chief reason for this is lack of knowledge on the part of our ladies know how to do a thing yourself and you will get it well done by others but how are many of them to know the daughters of the wealthy in this country often marry struggling men and they know less about domestic economy than ladies of the higher ranks abroad not because english or french ladies take more part in housekeeping 
but because they are at home all their lives ladies of the highest rank never go to a boarding or any other school and these are the women who with some few exceptions know best how things should be done they are at home listening to criticisms from papa who is an epicure perhaps on the shortcomings of his own table or his neighbours from mamma as to what the soup lacks why cook is not a cordon bleu etc while our girls are at school far away from domestic comments deep in the agonies of algebra perhaps and directly they leave school in many cases they marry as a preparation for the state of matrimony most of them learn how to make cake and preserves and the very excellence of their attainments in that way proves how easy it would be for them with their dainty fingers and good taste to far excel their european cousins in that art which a french writer says is based on reason health common sense and sound taste here let me say i do not by any means advocate a woman who can afford to pay a first-rate cook avoiding the expense by cooking herself on the contrary i think no woman is justified in doing work herself that she has the means given her to get done by employing others i have no praise for the economical woman who from a desire to save does her own work without necessity for economy it is not her work the moment she can afford to employ others it is the work of some less fortunate person but in this country it often happens that a good cook is not to be found for money although the raw material of which one might be made is much oftener at hand and if ladies would only practise the culinary art with as much nay half as much assiduity as they give to a new pattern in crochet devote as much time to attaining perfection in one dish or article of food be it perfect bread or some french dish which father brother or husband goes to delmonico's to enjoy as they do to the crochet tidies or embroidered rugs with which they decorate their drawing-rooms they could then take the material in the shape of any ambitious girl they may meet with and make her a fine cook in the time they take to make a dozen tidies they would have a dozen dishes at their fingers ends and let me tell you the woman who can cook a dozen things outside of preserves in a perfect manner is a rarity here and a good cook anywhere for by the time the dozen are accomplished she will have learned so much of the art of cooking that all else will come easy one good soup bouillon and you have the foundation of all others two good sauces white sauce and brown les sauces mères, as the french call them mothers of all other sauces and all others are matters of detail learn to make one kind of roll perfectly as light plump and crisp as delmonico's and all varieties are at your fingers ends you can have kringles vienna rolls kritznock horns yorkshire tea cakes english sally lunns and bath buns all are then as easy to make as common soda biscuit in fact in cooking as in many other things ce n'est que le premier pas que coûte failures are almost certain at the beginning but a failure is often a step toward success if we only knew the reason of the failure End of chapter 1chapter two of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by peter yearsley culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by catherine owen chapter two on bread of all articles of food bread is perhaps the one about which most has been written most instruction given and most failures made yet what adds more to the elegance of a table than exquisite bread or breads and unless you live in a large city and depend on the baker what so rare a lady who is very proud of her table and justly so said to me quite lately i cannot understand how it is we never have really fine home-made bread i have tried many recipes following them closely and i can't achieve anything but a commonplace loaf with a thick hard crust and as for rolls they are my despair 
i have wasted eggs butter and patience so often that i have determined to give them up but a fine loaf i will try for and when you achieve the fine loaf you may revel in home-made rolls i answered and so i advise everyone first to make perfect bread light white crisp and thin crusted that rarest thing in home-made bread i have read over many recipes for bread and am convinced that when the time allowed for rising is specified it is invariably too short one standard book directs you to leave your sponge two hours and the bread when made up a quarter of an hour this recipe strictly followed must result in heavy tough bread as bread is so important and so many fail i will give my own method from beginning to end not that there are not numberless good recipes but simply because they frequently need adapting to circumstances and altering a recipe is one of the things a tyro fears to do i make a sponge overnight using a dried yeast cake soaked in a pint of warm water to which i add a spoonful of salt and if the weather is warm as much soda as will lie on a dime make this into a stiff batter with flour it may take a quart or less flour varies so much to give a rule is impossible but if after standing the sponge has a watery appearance make it thicker by sprinkling in more flour beat hard a few minutes and cover with a cloth in winter keep a piece of thick flannel for the purpose as a chill is fatal to your sponge and set in a warm place free from draughts the next morning when the sponge is quite light that is to say at least twice the bulk it was and like a honeycomb take two quarts of flour more or less as you require but i recommend at first a small baking and this will make three small loaves in winter flour should be dried and warmed put it in your mixing bowl and turn the sponge into a hole in the centre have ready some water rather more than lukewarm but not hot add it gradually stirring your flour into the sponge at the same time the great fault in making bread is getting the dough too stiff it should be as soft as possible without being at all sticky or wet now knead it with both hands from all sides into the centre keep this motion occasionally dipping your hands into the flour if the dough sticks but do not add more flour unless the paste sticks very much if you have the right consistency it will be a smooth mass very soft to the touch yet not sticky but this may not be attained at a first mixing without adding flour by degrees when you have kneaded the dough until it leaves the bowl all round set it in a warm place to rise when it is well risen feels very soft and warm to the touch and is twice its bulk knead it once more thoroughly then put it in tins either floured and the flour not adhering shaken out or buttered putting in each a piece of dough half the size you intend your loaf to be now everything depends on your oven many people bake their bread slowly leaving it in the oven a long time and this causes a thick hard crust when baked in the modern iron oven quick baking is necessary let the oven be quite hot then put a little ball of paste in and if it browns palely in seven to ten minutes it is about right if it burns it is too hot open the damper ten minutes your bread after it is in the tins will rise much more quickly than the first time let it get light but not too light twice its bulk is a good rule but if it is light before your oven is ready and thus in danger of getting too porous work it down with your hand it will not harm it although it is better so to manage that the oven waits for the bread rather than the bread for the oven a small loaf and by all means make them small until you have gained experience will not take more than three-quarters of an hour to bake when a nice yellow brown take it out turn it out of the tin into a cloth and tap the bottom if it is crisp and smells cooked the loaf is done once the bottom is brown it need remain no longer should that however from fault of your oven be not brown but soft and white you must put it back in the oven the bottom upwards 
An oven that does not bake at the bottom will, however, be likely to spoil your bread. It is sometimes caused by a careless servant leaving a collection of ashes underneath it. Satisfy yourself that all the flues are perfectly clean and clear before beginning to bake, and if it still refuses to do its duty, change it, for you will have nothing but loss and vexation of spirit while you have it in use. I think you will find this bread white, evenly porous, note not with small holes in one part and caverns in another. If it is so, you have made your dough too stiff, and it is not sufficiently kneaded, end note and with a thin, crisp crust. Bread will surely fail to rise at all if you have scalded the yeast. The water must never be too hot. In winter, if it gets chilled, it will only rise slowly or not at all, and in using baker's or German yeast, take care that it is not stale, which will cause heavy, irregular bread. In making bread with compressed yeast, proceed in exactly the same way excepting that the sponge will not need to be set overnight, unless you want to bake very early. If you have once produced bread to your satisfaction, you will find no difficulty in making rolls. Proceed as follows. Take a piece of the dough from your baking after it has risen once. To a piece as large as a man's fist, take a large tablespoonful of butter and a little powdered sugar. Work them into the dough, put it in a bowl, cover it, and set it in a warm place to rise. A shelf behind the stove is best. If you make this at the same time as your bread, you will find it takes longer to rise. The butter causes that difference. When very light, much lighter than your bread should be, take your hand and push it down until it is not larger than when you put it in the bowl. Let it rise again, and again push it down, but not so thoroughly. Do this once or twice more, and you have the secret of light rolls. You will find them rise very quickly after once or twice pushing down. When they have risen the third or fourth time, take a little butter on your hands and break off small pieces about the size of a walnut and roll them round. Either put them on a tin close together to be broken apart, or an inch or two from each other, in which case work in a little more flour and cut a cleft on the top and once more set to rise. Half an hour will be long enough generally, but in this case you must judge for yourself. They sometimes take an hour. If they look swelled very much and smooth, they will be ready. Have a nice hot oven and bake for twelve to fifteen minutes. Add a little more sugar to your dough and an egg. Go through the same process. Brush them over with sugar dissolved in milk, and you will have delicious rusks. The above is my own method of making rolls, and the simplest I know of, but there are numbers of other recipes given in cookery books, which would be just as good if the exact directions for letting them rise were given. As a test, and every experiment you try will be so much gained in your experience, follow the recipe given for rolls in any good cookery book, take part of the dough and let it rise as therein directed, and bake set the other part to rise as I direct, and notice the difference. Kreuznach Horns Either take a third of the dough made for bread with three quarts of flour, or set a sponge with a pint of flour and a yeast cake soaked in half a pint of warm water or milk, making it into a stiffish dough with another pint of flour. Then add four ounces of butter, a little sugar, and two eggs. Work well. If you use the bread dough, you will need to dredge in a little more flour, on account of the eggs, but not very much. Then set to rise as for rolls, work it down twice or thrice, then turn the dough out on the moulding board lightly floured. Roll it as you would pie crust, into pieces six inches square and quarter of an inch thick. Make two sharp quick cuts across it from corner to corner, and you will have from each square four three-cornered pieces of paste. Spread each thinly with soft butter, flour lightly, and roll up very lightly from the wide side, taking care that it is not squeezed together in any way. Lay them on a tin with the side on which the point comes uppermost, and bend round in the form of a horseshoe. These will take some time to rise. When they have swollen much and look light, brush them over with white of egg, not beaten, or milk and butter, and bake in a good oven. 
Kringles are made from the same recipe, but with another egg and two ounces of sugar, powdered, added to the dough, when first set to rise. Then, when well risen two or three times, instead of rolling with a pin as for horns, break off pieces, roll between your hands, as thick as your finger, and form into figure eights, rings, fingers, or take three strips, flour and roll them as thick as your finger, tapering at each end, lay them on the board, fasten the three together at one end, and then lay one over the other in a plait, fasten the other end, and set to rise, bake when done, brush over with sugar dissolved in milk, and sprinkle with sugar. All these breads are delicious for breakfast, and may easily be had without excessive early rising, if the sponge is set in the morning, dough made in the afternoon, and the rising and working done in the evening, when, instead of making up into rolls, horns, or cringles, push the dough down thoroughly, cover with a damp folded cloth, and put in a very cold place, if in summer, not on ice, of course, then next morning, as soon as the fire is alight, mould, but do not push down any more, put in a very warm spot, and when light, bake. In summer, as I have said, I think it safest, to prevent danger of souring, to put a little soda in the sponge for bread, and for rolls or anything requiring to rise several times, it is an essential precaution. Brioche. I suppose the very name of this delectable French dainty will call up in the mind's eye of many who read this book that great little shop, au grand brioche, on the boulevard Poissonniere, where, on Sunday afternoons, scores of boys from the lycée form en queue with the general public, waiting the hour when the piles of golden brioche shall be ready to exchange for their eager sous. But I venture to say a really fine brioche is rarely eaten on this side the Atlantic. They, being a luxury, welcome to all, and especially aromatic of Paris, I tried many times to make them, obtaining for that purpose recipes from French friends, and from standard French books, but never succeeded in producing the ideal brioche, until I met with Gouffle's great book, the Livre de Cuisine, after reading which, I may here say, all secrets of the French kitchen are laid bare. No effort is spared to make everything plain, from the humble pot au feu to the most gorgeous monumental plat, and I would refer to any one who wants to become proficient in any French dish to that book, feeling sure that in following strictly the directions there will be no failure. It is the one book I have met with on the subject, in which no margin is left for your own knowledge, if you have it, to fill up. But to the brioche. Paris Jockey Club Recipe for Brioche Sift one pound of flour, take one-fourth of it, and add rather more than half a cake of compressed yeast, dissolved in half a gill of warm water. Make into a sponge with a very little more water, put in a warm place. When it is double its volume, take the rest of the flour, make a hole in the centre, and put in it an equal quantity of salt and sugar, about a teaspoonful, and two tablespoonfuls of water, to dissolve them, three quarters of a pound of butter and four eggs, beat well, then add another egg, beat again, and add another, and so on, until seven have been used. The paste must be soft, but not spread. If too firm, add another egg. Now mix this paste with the sponge thoroughly, beating until the paste leaves the sides of the bowl. Then put it into a crock and cover. Let it stand four hours in a warm place. Then turn it out on a board, spread it and double it four times, return it to the crock, and let it rise again two hours. Repeat the former process of doubling and spreading, and put it in a very cold place for two hours, or until you want to use it. Mould in any form you like, but the true brioche is two pieces, one as large again as the other. Form the large one into a ball, make a deep depression in the centre, on which place the smaller ball, pressing it gently in. Cut two or three gashes round it with a sharp knife, and bake a beautiful golden brown. These brioches are such a luxury, and so sure to come out right, that the trouble of making them is well worth the taking, 
and for another reason every one knows the great difficulty of making puff paste in summer and a short paste is never handsome but take a piece of brioche paste roll it out thin dredge it with flour fold and roll again then use as you would puff paste if for sweet pastry a little powdered sugar may be sprinkled through it instead of dredging with flour this makes a very handsome and delicious crust or another use to which it may be put is to roll it out cut it in rounds lay on them mincemeat orange marmalade jam or merely sprinkle with currants chopped citron and spices fold press the edges and bake before quitting the subject of breads i must introduce a novelty which i call souffle bread it is quickly made possible even when the fire is poor and so delicious that i know you will thank me for making you acquainted with it use two or three eggs according to size you wish and to each egg a tablespoonful of flour mix the yolks with the flour and with them a dessert spoonful of butter melted and enough milk to make a very thick batter work add a pinch of salt and a teaspoonful of sugar work till quite smooth then add the whites of the eggs in a firm froth stir them in gently and add a quarter teaspoon of soda and half a one of cream of tartar have ready an iron frying pan or an earthen one that will stand heat is better made hot with a tablespoonful of butter in it also hot but not so hot as for frying pour the batter which should be of the consistency of sponge cake batter into the pan cover it with a lid or tin plate and set it back of the stove if the fire is hot if very slow it may be forward when well risen and nearly done put it in the oven or if the oven is cold you may turn it gently not to deaden it serve when done try with a twig the underside uppermost it should be of a fine golden brown and look like an omelette this souffle bread is equally good baked in a tin in which is rather more butter than enough to grease it the oven must be very hot indeed cover it for the few minutes with a tin plate or lid to prevent it scorching before it has risen when it has puffed up remove the lid and allow it to brown ten to fifteen minutes should bake it turn it out as you would sponge cake very carefully not to deaden it to succeed with bread you must use the very best flour end of chapter two chapter three of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter three pastry to make good puff paste is a thing many ladies are anxious to do and in which they generally fail and this not so much because they do not make it properly as because they handle it badly a lady who was very anxious to excel in pastry once asked me to allow her to watch me make paste i did so and explained that there was more in the manner of using than in the making up i then gave her a piece of my paste when completed and asked her to cover some patty pans while i covered others cautioning her as to the way she must cover them yet when those covered by her came out of the oven they had not risen at all they were like rich short paste while my own made from the same paste were toppling over with lightness i had without saying anything pressed my thumb slightly on one spot of one of mine in that spot the paste had not risen at all and i think this practical demonstration of what i had tried to explain was more useful than an hour's talk would have been i will first give my method of making which is the usual french way of making feuilletonnage take one pound of butter or half of it lard press all the water out by squeezing it in a cloth this is important as the liquid in it would wet your paste take a third of the butter or butter and lard and rub it into one pound of fine flour add no salt if your butter is salted then take enough water to which you may add the well-beaten white of an egg but it is not absolutely necessary 
to make the flour into a smooth firm dough it must not be too stiff or it will be hard to roll out or too soft or it will never make good paste it should roll easily yet not stick work it till it is very smooth then roll it out till it is half an inch thick now lay the whole of the butter in the center fold one-third the paste over then the other third it is now folded in three with the butter completely hidden now turn the ends toward you and roll it till it is half an inch thick taking care by rolling very evenly that the butter is not pressed out at the other end now you have a piece of paste about two feet long and not half that width flour it lightly and fold over one-third and under one-third which will almost bring it to a square again turn it round so that what was the side is now the end and roll most likely now the butter will begin to break through in which case fold it after flouring lightly in three as before and put it on a dish on the ice covering it with a damp cloth you may now either leave it for an hour or two or till next day paste made the day before it is used is much better and easier to manage and in winter it may be kept for four or five days in a cold place using from it as required when ready to use your paste finish the making by rolling it out dredging a little flour and doubling it in three as before and roll it out thin do this until from first to last it has been so doubled and rolled seven times great cooks differ on one or two points in making pastry for instance sawyer directs you to put the yolk of an egg instead of the white and a squeeze of lemon juice into the flour and expressly forbids you to work it before adding the mass of butter while jules gouffet says work it until smooth and shining i cannot pretend to decide between these differing doctors but i pursue the method i have given and always have a light pastry and now to the handling of it it must only be touched by the lightest fingers every cut must be made with a sharp knife and done with one quick stroke so that the paste is not dragged at all in covering a pie dish or patty pan you are commonly directed to mould the paste over it as thin as possible which conveys the idea that the paste is to be pressed over and so made thin this would destroy the finest paste in the world roll it thin say for small tartlets less than a quarter of an inch thick for a pie a trifle thicker then lay the dish or tin to be covered on the paste and cut out with a knife dipped in hot water or flour a piece a little larger than the mould then line with the piece you have cut touching it as little as possible press only enough to make the paste adhere to the bottom but on no account press the border to test the necessity of avoiding this gently press one spot on a tart before putting it in the oven only so much as many people always do in making pie and watch the result when your tartlets or pies are made take each up on your left hand and with a sharp knife dipped in flour trim it round quickly to make the cover of a pie adhere to the under crust lay the forefinger of your right hand lengthwise round the border but as far from the edge as you can thus forming a groove for the syrups and pressing the cover on at the same time a word here about fruit pies pile the fruit high in the centre leaving a space all around the sides almost bare of fruit when the cover is on press gently the paste as i have explained into this groove then make two or three deep holes in the groove the juice will boil out of these holes and run around this groove instead of boiling out through the edges and wasting this is the pastry cook's way of making pies and makes a much handsomer one than the usual flat method besides saving your syrup to ornament fruit pies or tartlets whip the white of an egg and stir in as much powdered sugar as will make a thin meringue a large tablespoonful is usually enough then when your pies or tartlets are baked take them from the oven glaze with the egg and sugar and return to the oven leaving the door open when it has set into a frosty icing they are ready to serve it is worth while to accomplish puff paste for so many dainty trifles may be made with it which attempted with the ordinary short paste would be unsightly some of these that seem to me novel i will describe risolettes are made with trimmings of puff paste if you have about a quarter of a pound left roll it out very thin 
about as thick as a fifty cent piece put about half a spoonful of marmalade or jam on it in places about an inch apart wet lightly round each and place a piece of paste over all take a small round cutter as large as a dollar and press round the part where the marmalade or jam is with the thick part of the cutter then cut them out with a cutter a size larger lay them on a baking tin brush over with white of egg then cut some little rings the size of a quarter dollar put one on each egg over again and bake twenty minutes in a nice hot oven then sift white sugar all over put them back in the oven to glaze a little red currant jelly in each ring looks pretty serve in the form of a pyramid pastry tablets cut strips of paste three inches and a half long and an inch and a half wide and as thick as a twenty-five cent piece lay on half of them a thin filmy layer of jam or marmalade not jelly then on each lay a strip without jam and bake in a quick oven when the paste is well risen and brown take them out glaze them with white of egg and sugar and sprinkle chopped almonds over them return to the oven till the glazing is set and the almonds just colored serve them hot or cold on a napkin piled log cabin fashion frangipani tartlets one quarter pint of cream four yolks of eggs two ounces of flour three macaroons four tablespoonfuls of powdered sugar the peel of a grated lemon and a little citron cut very fine a little brandy and orange flower water put all the ingredients except the eggs in a saucepan of course you will mix the flour smooth in the cream first let them come to a boil slowly stirring to prevent lumps when the flour smells cooked take it off the fire for a minute then stir the beaten yolks of eggs into it stand the saucepan in another of boiling water and return to the stove stirring till the eggs seem done about five minutes if the water boils all the time line patty pans with puff paste and fill with frangipani and bake ornament with chopped almonds and meringue or not as you please it is very difficult to make fine puff paste in warm weather and almost impossible without ice for this reason i think the brioche paste preferable but if it is necessary to have it for any purpose you must take the following precautions have your water iced have your butter as firm as possible by being kept on ice till the last moment make the paste in the coolest place you have and under the breeze of an open window if possible make it the day before you use it and put it on the ice between every turn as each rolling out is technically called then leave it on the ice as you use it taking pieces from it as you need them so that the warmth cannot soften the whole at once when it would become quite unmanageable the condition of the oven is a very important matter and i cannot do better than transcribe the rules given by gouffet by which you may test its fitness for any purpose put half a sheet of writing paper in the oven if it catches fire it is too hot open the dampers and wait ten minutes when put in another piece of paper if it blackens it is still too hot ten minutes later put in a third piece if it gets dark brown the oven is right for all small pastry called dark brown paper heat light brown paper heat is suitable for vol vent or fruit pies dark yellow paper heat for large pieces of pastry or meat pies pound cake bread etc light yellow paper heat for sponge cake meringues etc to obtain these various degrees of heat you try paper every ten minutes till the heat required for your purpose is attained but remember that light yellow means the paper only tinged dark yellow the paper the color of ordinary pine wood light brown is only a shade darker about the color of nice pie crust and dark brown a shade darker by no means coffee color end of chapter three chapter four of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by matthew tink culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter four what to have in your storeroom one great trouble with many young housekeepers is betrayed by the common remark 
Cookery books always require so many things that one never has in the house, and they coolly order you to moisten with gravy, take a little gravy, as if you had only to go to the pump and get it. It is very true that economy in cooking is much aided by having a supply of various condiments. Warmed over meat may then be converted into a delicious little entree with little trouble. I would recommend, therefore, anyone who is in earnest about reforming her dinner table to begin by expending a few dollars in the following articles. One bottle of capers, olives, gherkins, soy, anchovies, tarragon vinegar. One bottle of claret, white wine, sherry for cooking, brandy, Harvey sauce, walnut ketchup, and a package of compressed vegetables and a few bay leaves. Ten dollars thus spent may seem a good deal of money to a young housewife trying to make her husband's salary go as far as it will. But I assure her it is in the end an economy, especially in a small family, who is so apt to get tired of seeing the same thing that it has to be thrown or given away. With these condiments, and others I have yet to mention, you will have no trouble in using every scrap. Not using it and eating it from a sense of duty and wishing it was something better, but enjoying it. With your storeroom well provided, you can indeed go for gravy, as if to the pump. Besides the foregoing list of articles to be bought off any good grocer, there are others which can be made at home to advantage, and once made are always ready. Mushroom powder I prefer for any use to mushroom catsup. It is easily made and its uses are infinite. Sprinkled over steak, when it must be sifted, or chops, it is delicious. For ordinary purposes, such as flavouring soup or gravy, it need not be sifted. To prepare it, take a peck of large and very fresh mushrooms, look them over carefully that they are not wormy, then cleanse them with a piece of flannel from sand or grit. Then peel them and put them in the sun or a cool oven to dry. They require long, slow drying and must become in a state to crumble. Your peck will have diminished by the process into half a pint or less of mushroom powder, but you have the means with it of making a rich gravy at a few minutes' notice. Apropos of gravies, that much vexed question in small households, for without gravies on hand you cannot make good hash, or many other things that are miserable without it and excellent with it. Yet how difficult is it to have gravy always on hand. Every mistress of a small family knows, in spite of the constant advice to save your trimming to make stock. Do by all means save your bones, gristle, odds and ends of meat of all kinds, and convert them into broth. But even if you do, it often happens that the days that you have done so, no gravy is required, and then it sours quickly in summer, although it may be arrested by reboiling. In no family of three or four are there odds and ends enough, unless there is a very extravagant table kept, to ensure stock for every day. My remedy for this, then, is to make a stock that will keep for months or years. In other words, glaze. So very rarely forming part of a housewife's stores, yet so valuable that the fact is simply astonishing. With a piece of glaze, you have a dish of soup on an emergency, rich gravy for any purpose and all with the expenditure of less time that would make a pot of sweetmeats. Take six pounds of a knuckle of veal or leg of beef, cut it in pieces the size of an egg, as also half a pound of lean ham. Then rub a quarter of a pound of butter on the bottom of your pot, which should hold two gallons. Then put in the meat with half a pint of water, three middle-sized onions with two cloves in each, a turnip, a carrot, and a small head of celery. Then place over a quick fire, occasionally stirring it round, until the bottom of the pot is covered with a thick glaze, which will adhere lightly to the spoon. Then fill up the pot with cold water. And when on the boiling point, draw it to the back of the stove, where it may gently simmer three hours, if feel, six of beef, carefully skimming it to remove scum. This stock, as it is, will make a delicious foundation with the addition of salt for all kinds of clear soup or gravies. To reduce it to glaze, proceed as follows. Pass the stock through a fine hair sieve or cloth into a pan. Then fill up the pot again with hot water. 
and let it boil four hours longer to obtain all the glutinous part from the meat. Strain and pour both stocks in a large pot or stew pan together. Set it over the fire and let it boil as fast as possible with the lid off, leaving a large spoon in it to prevent it boiling over and to stir occasionally. When reduced to about three pints, pour it into a small stew pan or saucepan, set again to boil, but more slowly, skimming it if necessary. When it is reduced to a quart, set it where it will again boil quickly, stirring it well with a wooden spoon until it begins to get thick and of a fine yellowish brown color. At this point, be careful it does not burn. You may either pour it into a pot for use or, what is more convenient for making gravies, get a sausage skin from your butcher, cut a yard of it, tie one end very tightly, then pour into it by means of a large funnel, the glaze. From this cut slices for use. A thick slice dissolved in hot water makes a cup of nutritious soup, into which you may put any cooked vegetables, or rice, or barley. A piece is very useful to take on a journey, especially for an invalid who does not want to depend on wayside hotel food, or is tired of beef tea. The foregoing is the orthodox recipe for glaze, and if you have to buy meat for the purpose, the very best way in which you can make it. But if it happened that you have some strong meat, soup, or jelly, for which you have no use while fresh, then boil it down till it is thick and brown, not burnt. It will be excellent glaze. Not so fine in flavour, perhaps, but it preserves to good use what would otherwise be lost. Very many people do not know the value of pork for making jelly. If you live in the country and kill a pig, use these hocks for making glaze instead of beef. Glaze also adds much to the beauty of many dishes. If roast beef is not quite brown enough on any one spot, set your jar of glaze. For this purpose, it is well to have some put in a jar as well as in the skin in boiling water. Keep a small stiff brush, such as are sold for the purpose at house furnishing stores called a glazing brush are best. But you may manage with any other, or even a stiff feather. When the glaze softens, as glue would do, brush over your meat with it. It will give the lacking brown, or if you have a ham or tongue you wish to decorate, you may varnish it, as it were, with the melted glaze. Then when cold, Beat some fresh butter to a white cream, and with a kitchen syringe if you have one, a stiff paper funnel if you have not, trace any design you please on the glazed surface. This makes a very handsome dish, and if your ham has been properly boiled, will be very satisfactory to the palate. Of the boiling of ham, I will speak in another chapter. I have a few more articles to recommend for your storeroom, and then I think you will find yourself equal to the emergency of providing an elegant little meal if called upon unexpectedly. Provided you have any cold scraps at all in the house, and maitre d'hôtel butter. To make the latter, take half a pound of fine butter, one tablespoonful of very fresh parsley, chopped, not too fine, salt, pepper, and a small tablespoonful of lemon juice. Mix together, but do not work more than sufficient for that purpose, and pack in a jar, keeping it in a cool place. A tablespoonful of this lard in a hot dish on which you serve beef steak, chops, or any kind of fish is a great addition and turns plain boiled potatoes into pommes de terre a la maitre d'hôtel. It is excellent with stewed potatoes or added to anything for which parsley is needed and not always at hand. A spoonful with half the quantity of flour stirred into a gill of milk or water makes a renowned maitre d'hôtel sauce or English parsley butter. For boiled fish, mutton or veal. In short, it is one of the most valuable things to have in the house. Equally valuable even, and more elegant, is the preparation known as ravigotte, or Montpellier butter. Take one pound in equal quantities of chervil, tarragon, burnet pimpernel, chives, and garden cress peppergrass. Scald two minutes, drain quite dry, Pound in a mortar three hard eggs, three anchovies, and one scant ounce of pickled cucumbers, and same quantity of capers well pressed to extract the vinegar. Add salt, pepper, and a bit of garlic half as large as a pea. Rub all through a sieve, then put a pound of fine butter into the mortar, which must be well cleansed from the herbs. Add the herbs with two tablespoonfuls of oil 
and one of tarragon vinegar. Mix perfectly, and if not of a fine green, add the juice of some pounded spinach. This is a celebrated Beau de Montpellier sold in Paris, in tiny jars at a high price. Ravigotte is the same thing, only in place of the eggs, anchovies, pickles and capers, put half a pound more butter. It is good, but less piquant. Pack in a jar and keep cool. This butter is excellent for many purposes. For salad, beaten with oil, vinegar and yolks of eggs as for mayonnaise, it makes a delicious dressing. For cold meat or fish, it is excellent and also for chops. Two or three other articles serve to simplify the art of cooking in its especially difficult branches, and in the branches a lady finds difficult to attend to herself without remaining in the kitchen until the last minute before dinner. But with the aid of Blanc and Roux, a fairly intelligent girl can make excellent sauces. For Roux, melt slowly half a pound of butter over the fire, skim it, let it settle, then dredge in eight ounces of fine flour. Stir it till it is of a bright brown, then put away in a jar for use. Blanc is the same thing, only it is not allowed to brown. It should be stirred only enough to make all hot through, then put away in a jar. If you need thickening for a white sauce and do not wish to stand over it yourself, having taught your cook the simple fact that a piece of Blanc put into the milk before it boils, or it will harden instead of melt, and allowed to dissolve, stirring constantly, will make the sauce you wish. She will be able at all times to produce a white sauce that you need not be ashamed of. When the sauce is nearly ready to serve, stir in a good piece of butter, a large spoonful to half a pint. When mixed, the sauce is ready. Brown sauce can always be made by taking a cup of broth or soup and dissolving in the same way a piece of the roux, and also, if desired, a piece of the Montpellier butter. If there is no soup, of course, you make it with a piece of glaze. Brown flour is also a convenient thing to have ready. It is simply cooking flour in the oven until it is a pale brown. If it is allowed to get dark, it will be bitter. And, that it may brown evenly, it requires to be laid on a large flat baking pan and stirred often. Useful for thickening stews, hash, etc. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Tink – Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen, by Catherine Owen Chapter 5 – Luncheon Luncheon is usually, in this country, either a forlorn meal of cold meat or hash, or else a sort of early dinner, both of which are a mistake. If it is veritably luncheon, and not early dinner, it should be as unlike that later meal as possible. For variety's sake, and in any but very small families, there are so many dishes more suitable for luncheon than any other meal, that it is easy to have great variety with very little trouble. I wish it were more the fashion here, to have many of the cold dishes which are popular on the other side of the Atlantic, and in spite of the fact that table prejudices are very difficult to get over, I will append a few recipes in the hope that some lady, more progressive than prejudiced, may give them a trial, convinced that their excellence, appearance, and convenience will win them favour. By having most dishes cold at luncheon, it makes it a distinct meal from the hot breakfast and dinner. In summer, the cold food in a salad is especially refreshing. In winter, a nice hot soup or puree. Thick soup is preferable at luncheon to clear, which is well fitted to precede a heavy meal. And some savoury entree are very desirable, while cold raised pie, galantine, jellied fish, and potted meats may ever, at that season, find their appropriate place on the luncheon table. The potatoes, which are the only vegetable introduced at strict lunch, should be prepared in some fancy manner, as croquettes, mashed and browned, a la maitre d'hôtel, or in snow. The latter mode is pretty and novel. I will therefore include it in my recipes for luncheon dishes. Omelettes too are excellent at luncheon. 
In these remarks, I am thinking especially of large families whose luncheon table might be provided with a dish of galantine, one of collared fish, and a meat pie, besides a steak, cutlets, or warmed over meat, without anything going to waste. In winter, most cold jellied articles will keep a fortnight and in summer three or four days. Windsor pie. Take slices of veal cutlet half an inch thick and very thin slices of lean boiled ham. Put at the bottom of one of these veal pie dishes or bakers, about two to three inches deep, a layer of the veal, seasoned, then one of ham, then one of force meat, made as follows. Take a little veal, or if you have sausage meat ready made, it will do. As much fine dry bread crumbs, a dessert spoonful of finely chopped parsley, in which is a salt spoonful of powdered thyme, savory, and marjoram if you have them with salt and pepper, and mix with enough butter to make it a crumbling paste. Lay a thin layer of this on the ham, then another of veal, then ham and force meat again, until the dish is quite full. Lay something flat upon it, and then await for an hour. He must have prepared from bones and scraps of veal about a pint of stiff veal jelly. Pour this over the meat, and then take strips of rich puff paste, the brioche paste would be excellent in hot weather. Wet the edge of the dish and lay the strips round, pressing them lightly to the dish. Roll the cover a little larger than the top of the dish and lay it on, first wetting the surface, not the edge, of the strips round the lips of the dish. Press the two together, then make a hole in the center and ornament as you please. But I never ornament the edge of a pie as it is apt to prevent the paste from rising. An appropriate and simple ornament for meat pies is to roll a piece of paste very thin, cut it in four diamond shaped pieces, but one point of each to the hole in the center so that you have one on each end and one each side. Then roll another little piece of paste as thin as possible. Flour it and double it, then double it again. Bring all the corners together in your hand like a little bundle. Then with a sharp knife, give a quick cut over the top of the ball of paste, cutting quite deeply, then another across. If your cut has been clean and quick, you will now be able to turn half back the leaves of paste as if it were a half-blown rose. The ends which you have gathered together in your hand are to be inserted in the hole in the center of the pie. Then brush over with yolk of egg beaten very well in a little milk or water, and bake an hour and a half. This way of covering and ornamenting a pie is appropriate for all meat pies. Pigeon pie should, however, have the little red feet skinned by dipping in boiling water, then rubbed in a cloth when skin and nails peel off. If allowed to lie in the water, the flesh comes too. Then one pair is put at each end of the pie, a hole being cut to insert them, or four are put in the center instead of the rows. The Windsor pie is intended to be eaten cold, as are all veal and ham pies. The beauty of the jelly being lost in a hot pie, do not fail to try it on that account, for cold pies are excellent things. Another veal and ham pie, more usual and probably the wheel and hammer that melted the organ of Silas Wegg, was manufactured by Mrs. Boffin from this recipe, it is as follows. Take the thick part of a breast of veal, removing all the bones, which put on for gravy, stirring them long and slowly. Put a layer of veal, pepper, and salt, then a thin sprinkling of ham. If boiled, cut in slices. If raw, cut a slice in dice, which scold before using, then more veal and again ham. If force meat balls are liked, make some force meat as for Windsor pie, using, if you prefer it chopped, hard boiled eggs in place of chopped meat and binding into a paste with a raw egg. Then make into balls which drop into the crevices of the pie. Boil two or three eggs quite hard, cut each in four and lay them round the sides and over the top. Pour in about a gill of gravy and cover the same as the Windsor pie. In either of these pies, the force meat may be left out. A sweet bread cut up or mushrooms put in. A chicken pie to eat cold is very fine made in this way. Raised pork pies are so familiar to everyone who has visited England, and in spite of the greasy idea, are so very good that I introduce a well-tried recipe. Feeling sure anyone who eats pork at all will find it worthwhile to give them a trial. They will follow it with many another. The paste for them is made as follows. Rub into two pounds of flour a liberal half pound of butter. Then melt in half a pint of hot, but not boiling milk, another half pound or it may be lard, pour this into the flour and knead it into a smooth firm paste. Properly raised pies should be molded by hand and I will endeavour to describe the method in case any persevering lady would like to try and have the orthodox thing. But pie moulds of tin, 
opening at the side are to be bought and save much trouble. The mould if used should be well buttered and the pie taken out when done and returned to the oven for the sides to brown. To raise a pie proceed thus. While the paste is warm, form a ball of paste into a cone, then with the fist work inside it till it forms an oval cup. Continue to knead till you have the walls of an even thickness, then pinch a fold all round the bottom. If properly done, you have an oval, flat bottomed crust with sides about two inches high. Fill this with pork, fat and lean together, well peppered and salted. Then work an oval cover as near the size of the bottom cover as you can, and wet the edges of the wall. Lay the cover on and pinch to match the bottom. Ornament as directed for Windsor pie. Wash with egg and bake a pale brown in a moderate oven. They must be well cooked or the meat will not be good. One containing a pound of meat may be cooked an hour and a quarter. All these pies are served in slices cut through to the bottom. Galantines are very handsome dishes, not very difficult to make and generally popular. I give a recipe for a very simple and delicious one. Take a fine breast of veal, remove all gristle, tendons, bones, and trim to 15 inches in length and eight wide. Use the trimmings and bones to help make the jelly, then put on the meat a layer of force meat made thus. Take one pound of sausage meat or lean veal, to which add half a pound of bread crumbs, parsley and thyme to taste. Grate a little nutmeg, pepper, salt, and the juice of half a lemon. Have also some long strips an inch thick of fat bacon or pork, and lean of veal, and lean ham, well seasoned with pepper, salt, and finely chopped shallots. Lay on the meat a layer of force meat an inch thick, leaving an inch and a half on each side uncovered. Then lay on your strips of ham, veal, and bacon fat alternatively. Then another of force meat, but only half an inch thick, as too much force meat will spoil the appearance of the dish. If you have any cold tongue, lay some strips in. Also, a few blanched pistachio nuts to be obtained off a confectioner will give the appearance of true French galantine. Roll up the veal and sew it with a packing or coarse needle and fine twine. Tie it firmly up in a piece of linen. Observe that you do not put your pistachio nuts amid the force meat, where being green, their appearance will be lost. Put them in crevices of the meats. Cook this in sufficient water to cover, in which you must have the trimmings of the breast and a knuckle of veal, or hock of pork, two onions, a carrot, half a head of celery, two cloves, a blade of mace, and a good bunch of parsley, thyme and bay leaf, two ounces of salt. Set the pot on the fire till it is at boiling point, then draw it to the back and let it simmer three hours, skimming carefully. Then take it from the fire, leaving it in the stock till nearly cold. Then take it out, remove the string from the napkin, and roll the galantine up tighter. If too tight at first, it will be hard. Tying the napkin at each end only, then place it on a dish, set another dish on it, on which place a 14 pound weight. This will cause it to cut firm. When quite cold, Remove strings and cloth, and it is ready to be ornamented with jelly. When the stock in which the galantine was cooked is cold, take off the fat and clarify it. First trying, however, if it is in right condition, by putting a little on ice. If it is not stiff enough to cut firm, you must reduce it by boiling. If too stiff, that is approaching glaze. Add a little water, then clarify by adding whites of eggs, as directed to clarify soup. See soups. A glass of sherry and two spoonfuls of tarragon or common vinegar are a great improvement. Some people like this jelly cut in dice to ornament the galantine. Part of it may then also serve to ornament other dishes at the table. But I prefer to have the galantine enveloped in jelly, which may be done by putting it in an oblong soup tureen or other vessel that will contain it, leaving an inch space all round, then pouring the jelly over it. Jellied fish is a favourite dish with many, and is very simple to prepare. It is also very ornamental. Take flounders or almost any flat fish that is cheapest at the time you require them. Clean and scrape them, cut them in small pieces, but do not cut off the fins. Put them in a stew pan with a few small button onions or one large one, a half teaspoonful of sugar, a glass of sherry, a dessert spoonful of lemon juice, and a small bunch of parsley. To one large flounder put a quart of water, and if you're going to jelly oysters, put in their liquor and a little salt. Stew long and slowly, skimming well, then strain, and if not perfectly clear, clarify as elsewhere directed. 
See if your stock jellies by trying it on ice before you clarify. Now take a mould, put in it pieces of cold salmon, eels that have been cooked or oysters, the latter only just cooked enough in the stock to plump them. Pour a little of the jelly in the mould, then three or four half slices of lemon, then oysters or the cold fish, until the mould is near full, disposing the lemon so that it will be near the sides and decorate the jelly. Then pour the rest of the jelly over all and stand in boiling water for a few minutes, then put in a cold place. On ice is best for some hours. When about to serve, dip the mould in hot water, turn out on a dish, garnish with lettuce leaves or parsley and hard boiled eggs. The latter may be introduced into the jelly cut in quarters if it is desired. Very ornamental forcemeat balls made bright green with spinach juice are also an improvement in appearance. A new mayonnaise, soyas. Put a quarter of a pint of stiff veal jelly that has been nicely flavoured with vegetables on ice in a bowl, whisking it till it is a white froth. Then add half a pint of salad oil and six spoonfuls of tarragon vinegar, by degrees. First oil, then vinegar, continually whisking till it forms a white smooth sauce-like cream. Season with half a teaspoonful of salt, a quarter ditto of white pepper and a very little sugar. Whisk it a little more and it is ready. It should be dressed pyramidically over the article it is served with. The advantage of this sauce is that, although more delicate than any other, you may dress it to any height you like, and it will remain so any length of time. If the temperature is cool, it will remain hours without appearing greasy or melting. It is absolutely necessary, however, that it should be prepared on ice. All these dishes, however, are only adapted for large families, but there are several ways of improving on the ordinary lunch table of very small ones. And nothing is more pleasant for the mistress of one of these very small families than to have a friend drop in to lunch and have a recherche lunch to offer with little trouble. Warming over will aid her in this, and to that chapter one refer her, but there are one or two ways of having cold relishes always ready, which help out an impromptu meal wonderfully. Potted meats are a great resource to English housekeepers. This side of the Atlantic they are chiefly known through the medium of Cross and Blackwell, though latterly one or two American firms have introduced some very admirable articles of the sort. Homemade potted meats are, however, better and less expensive than those bought. They should be packed away in jars. Liebig's extract of meat jars not being too small for the purpose, as well covered with the fat they keep well. Once opened, they require eating within a week or ten days, except in very cold weather. Potted bloater is one of the least expensive and appetizing of all potted meats. To make it, take two or three or more bloaters, cut off the heads and cleanse them. Put them in the oven long enough to cook them through. Take them out, take off the skin, and remove the meat from the bones carefully. Put the meat of the fish in a jar with half its weight of butter. Leave it to slowly cook in a cool oven for an hour, then take it out. Put the fish into a mortar or strong dish, pour the butter on it carefully, but don't let the gravy pass too, unless the fish is to be eaten very quickly, as it would prevent it keeping. Beat both butter and fish till they form a paste, add a little cayenne, and press it into small pots, pouring on each melted butter or mutton sweat. Either should be the third of an inch thick on the bloater. This makes excellent sandwiches. Potted ham. Take any remains of ham you have, even fried, if of a nice quality, is good for the purpose. Take away all stringy parts, sinew, or gristle, put it in a slow oven with its weight of butter, let it stay macerating in the butter till very tender, then beat it in a mortar, add cayenne, and pack in pots in the same way as the bloater. Thus you may put odds and ends of any meat or fish you have, and as a little potted meat goes a long way, when you have a little lobster, a bit of chicken breast, or even cold veal, I advise you to use it in this way. You will then have a little stock of dainties in the house to fall back on at any time for unexpected calls. A very important thing in the country. Potted chicken or veal requires either a little tongue or lean ham to give flavour, but failing these, a little ravigot butter, beaten in after the meat is well pounded, is by no means a bad substitute. Many people like the flavour of anchovies, but do not like the idea of eating raw fish. For these, anchovy butter is very acceptable. Take the anchovies out of the liquor in which they are packed, but do not wash them. Put them in twice their weight of butter in a jar, which stand in boiling water. 
Set all back of the stove for an hour, then pound, add cayenne, and pack in glasses. Unexpected company to luncheon with a lady who has to eat that meal alone generally, and, as is the unwise way of such ladies, makes it a very slender meal, is one of the ordeals of a young housekeeper, company to lunch and nothing in the house. But there is generally a dainty luncheon in every house if you know how to prepare it. There certainly always will be if you keep your storeroom supplied with the things I have named. Let the table be prettily laid at all times. Then if you have potted meat and preserves, have them put on the table. Are they called potatoes? If so, cut them up into potato salad if they are whole. If broken, warm them in a wine glass of milk, a teaspoonful of flour, and a piece as large as an egg of maitre d'hôtel butter. Have you such scraps of cold meat as could not come to table? Toss them up with a half cup of water, a slice of glaze, oh blessed ever ready glaze, a teaspoonful of ravigotte or maitre d'hôtel, and a teaspoonful of roux or blanc, according as your meat is light or dark. Season and serve. Or you have no meat, then you have eggs, and what better than an omelette, and such an omelette as the following? Take the crumb of a slice of bread, soak it in hot milk. Cold will do, but hot is better. Beat up whites of four eggs to a high froth. Mix the bread with all the milk it will absorb, no more, into a paste, add the yolks of eggs with a little salt, set the pan on the fire with an ounce of butter. Let it get very hot. Then mix the whites of eggs with the yolks and bread lightly, pour in the pan, and move about for a minute. If the oven is hot when the omelette is brown underneath, set the pan in the oven for five minutes, or until the top is set then double half over and serve. If your guests have a liking for sweets and your potted meats supply the savoury part of your luncheon, then have a brown gravy ready to serve with it. Put into a half cup of boiling water a slice of glaze, a spoonful of roux, and enough Harvey sauce or mushroom powder to flavour. If your omelette is to be sweet, before you fold it, put in a layer of preserves. The advantage of the omelette I have here given is that it keeps plump and tender till cold so that five minutes of waiting does not turn it into leather, the great objection with omelettes generally. Potatoes for luncheon, as I have said, should always be prepared in some fancy way, and snow is a very pretty one. Have some fine mealy potatoes boiled, carefully poured off, and set back of the stove with a cloth over them till they are quite dry and fall apart. Then have a colander, or coarse wire sieve, made hot and a hot dish in which to serve them, Pass the floury potatoes through the sieve, taking care not to crush the snow as it falls. You require a large dish heaping full, and be careful it is kept hot. This mode of preparing potatoes, although very pretty and novel, must never be attempted with any but the widest and mealiest kind. The remains of cold potatoes may be prepared thus. Put three ounces of butter in a frying pan, in which fry three onions sliced till tender, but not very brown, then put on the potatoes cut in slices, and shake them till they are of a nice brown colour. Put a spoonful of chopped parsley, salt, pepper and juice of a lemon. Shake well that all may mix together. Dish and serve very hot. End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Culture and Cooking or Art in the Kitchen by Catherine Owen. Chapter 6 A Chapter on General Management in Very Small Families. A very small family, a young menage, for instance, is very much more difficult to cater for without waste than a larger one. Two people are so apt to get tired of anything, be it ever so good eating, when it has been on the table once or twice. Therefore, it would be useless to make a galantine or the large pies I have indicated, except for occasions when guests are expected. But, as I hope to aid young housekeepers to have nice dishes when alone, I will devote this chapter to their needs. The chapter on warming over will be very useful also to this large class. In the first place, it is well to have regard, when part of a dish leaves the table, 
as to whether it or any particular part of it will make a nice little cold dish or a rechauffe in that case have it saved unless it is required for the servants dinner it is well to manage so that it is not needed for that purpose for instance if there is the wing and a slice or two of the breast of a chicken left it will make a dainty little breakfast dish or cold in jelly be nice for lunch there is always jelly if you have roast chicken if you manage properly and this is how you do it carefully save the feet throat gizzard and liver of your chickens scald the feet by pouring boiling water over them leave them just a minute and pull off the outer skin and nails they come away very readily leaving the feet delicately white put these with the other giblets properly cleansed into a small saucepan with an onion a slice of carrot a sprig of parsley and a pint of water if you have the giblets of one chicken if of two put a quart let this slowly simmer for two hours and a half it will be reduced to about half and form a stiff jelly when cold a glass of sherry and squeeze of lemon or teaspoonful of tarragon vinegar makes this into a delicious aspic and should be added if to be eaten cold the jelly must of course be strained in roasting chickens if you follow the rule for meat that is put no water in the pan but a piece of butter and dredge a very little flour over the chicken you will have a nice brown glaze at the bottom of the pan provided it has been cooked in a quick oven if in a cool oven there will be nothing brown at all but we will suppose the bird is brown to a turn pour your gravy from the giblets into the pan take off every bit of the glaze or osmazone that adheres and let it dissolve rubbing it with the back of the spoon then if you are likely to have any chicken left cold pour off a little gravy in a cup through a fine strainer leaving in your pan sufficient for the dinner in this mash up the liver till it is a smooth paste which thickens the gravy and serve some object to liver therefore the use of it is a matter of taste if you dress the chicken english fashion you will need the liver and gizzard to tuck under the wings in this case do only the feet and throat using a little meat of any kind if you have it to take their place but on no account fail to use the feet as they are as rich in jelly as calves feet in proportion to their size the jelly laid aside will be enough to ornament and give relish to a little dish of cold chicken and changes it from a dry and commonplace thing to a recherche one if two chickens are cooked it is a more economical than one there is then double the amount of gravy generally sufficient if you lay some very nice pieces of cold chicken in a bowl to pour over it and leave it enveloped in jelly you still then if from dinner for two people have perhaps joints enough to make a dish of curry or fricassee or any of the many ways in which cold chicken can be used for which see chapter on warming over for small households large joints are to be avoided but even a small roast is a large joint when there are but two or three to eat it for this reason it is a good plan to buy such joints as divide well a sirloin of beef is better made into two fine dishes than into one roast and then warmed over twice every one knows that filet de boeuf chateaubriand is one of the classical dishes of the french table that to a frenchman luxury can get no further but every one does not know how entirely within his power it is to have that dish as often as he has roast beef how convenient it would be to so have it here it is when your sirloin roast comes from the butcher take out the tenderloin or fillets which you must always choose thick cut it across into steaks an inch thick trim them cover them with a coat of butter or oil which is much better and broil them ten minutes turning them often garnish with fried potatoes and serve with sauce chateaubriand as follows put a gill of white wine or claret will do if you have no white into a saucepan with a piece of glaze weighing an ounce and a half add three-quarters of a pint of espagnole and simmer fifteen minutes when ready to serve thicken with two ounces of maitre d'hotel butter in which a dessert spoonful of flour has been worked that is how jules gouffet's recipe runs but 
as no small family will keep espagnol ready-made allow a little more glaze of course the recipe as given may be divided to half or quarter provided the correct proportions are retained and use a tablespoonful of roux and the maitre d'hotel butter both of which you have probably in your storeroom if not brown a little flour chop some parsley and add to two ounces of butter work them together then let them dissolve in the sauce for which purpose let it go off the boil let the sauce simmer a minute skim and serve the sirloin of beef denuded of its fillet is still a good roast and as you can't have your cake and eat it too and hot fresh roast beef is better than the same warmed over warm ye never so wisely i think this plan may commend itself to those who like nice little dinners a nice little dinner of a soup an entree or made dish salad and dessert really costs no more than frequent roast meat or even steak and pudding by following some such plan as this sunday pot au feu and roast lamb leg of mutton or other good joint etc monday rice or vermicelli soup made with remains of the bouillon from pot au feu if the sunday joint was a fore or hind quarter of lamb it should have been divided say the leg from the loin thus providing choice roasts for two days and yet having enough cold lamb that favorite dish with so many for luncheon with a salad and surprising to say after hot roast lamb for dinner sunday cold lunch for monday another roast monday and cold or warmed up for lunch tuesday there will still be supposing as i do in preparing this chapter that the family consists only of gentleman lady and servant remains enough from the two cold joints to make cromesquies of lamb see recipe a little dish of mince or a delicate saute of lamb for breakfast it is surprising what may be done with odds and ends in a small family a tiny plate of pieces far too small to make an appearance on the table and which if special directions are not given will seem to bridget not worth saving will with each piece dipped into the batter a la carême and fried in hot fat make a tempting dish for breakfast or an entree for dinner or luncheon two tablespoonfuls only of chopped meat of any kind will make croquettes for two or three people hence save the pieces but to return to our bills of fare i have given the two roasts of lamb for consecutive days because the weather in lamb season is usually too warm to keep it when this can be done however it is pleasanter to leave the second joint of lamb till tuesday should a forequarter a broad held in greater esteem than the hind quarter have been chosen get the butcher to take out the shoulder in one round thick joint english fashion this crisply roasted is far more delicious than the leg you then have the chops to be breaded and an excellent dish of the neck and breast either broiled curried stewed with peas or roast yet how often we see a whole quarter of lamb put in the oven for two or three people who get tired of the sight of it cold yet feel in economy bound to eat it should sirloin of beef have been the sunday dinner you will know what to do with it from directions already given and as a sirloin of beef even with the fillet out will be more than required for one dinner it may serve for a third day dressed in one of the various ways i shall give in chapter on warming over you have still at your disposal the bouilli or beef from which you have made your pot au feu which if it has been carefully boiled not galloped nor allowed to fall to rags is very good eating cut thin with lettuce or in winter celery in about equal quantities and a good salad dressing it is excellent or made into hash frittadella or even risoles is savory and delicious only bear in mind with this as all cooked meats the gravy drawn out must be replaced by stock or glaze it is very easy to warm over bouilli satisfactorily as a cup of the soup made from it can always be kept for gravy a leg of mutton makes two excellent joints and is seldom like cold as beef and lamb often are select a large fine leg have it cut across that each part may weigh about equally roast the thick or fillet end and serve with or without onion sauce a la soubise boil the knuckle in a small quantity of water just enough to cover it with a carrot turnip 
onion and bunch of parsley and salt in the water serve with caper sauce and mashed turnips the broth from this is excellent soup served thus skim it carefully take out the vegetables and chop a small quantity of parsley very fine then beat up in a bowl two eggs pour into them a little of the broth not boiling beating all the time then dry your soup back till it is off the boil and pour in the eggs stirring continually till it is on the boiling point again but it must not boil or the eggs will curdle and spoil the soup and then turn it into a hot tureen and serve use remains of the cold roast and boiled mutton together to make made dishes between the days of having the roast and boiled mutton you may have had a fowl and the remains from that will make you a second dish to go with your joint the remains from the first cooked mutton in form of curry mince salmi or saute will be a second dish with your fowl veal is one of the most convenient things to have for a small family as it warms over in a variety of ways and in some is actually better than when put on the table as a joint by having a little fish one day instead of soup and a little game another and remembering when you have an especially dainty thing to have one with it a little more substantial and less costly you may have variety at little expense for instance if you find it convenient to have for dinner frittadella see warming over or mariton of beef or cold mutton curried you might have broiled birds or roast pigeon or game in this consists good management to live so that the expenses of one day balance those of the other unless you are so happily situated that expense is a small matter in which case these remarks will not apply to you at all then never mind warming over or making one joint into two let your poor neighbors and bridget's friends enjoy your superfluity to the woman with a moderate income it usually is a matter of importance or ought to be that her weekly expenditure should not exceed a certain amount and for this she must arrange that any extra expense is balanced by a subsequent economy salads add much to the health and elegance of a dinner it is in early spring an expensive item if lettuce is used but no salad can be more delicious or more healthful than dressed celery and by buying when cheap arranging with a man to lay in your cellar covered with soil enough for the winter's use it need cost but moderately celeriac or turnip rooted celery is another salad that is very popular with our german friends it is a bulbous celery the root being the part eaten these are cooked like potatoes cut in slices and dressed with oil and vinegar or mayonnaise it is exceedingly good potato salad is always procurable and in summer at lunch instead of the hot vegetable or in winter when green salad is dear is very valuable it may be varied by the addition one day of a few chopped pickles another a little onion or celery or parsley or tarragon a little ravigote butter beaten to cream with the vinegar or with meat as follows boil the potatoes in their skins peel them cut them into pieces twice the thickness of a fifty cent piece and put them into a salad bowl with cold meat bouilli from soup is excellent put to them a teaspoonful of salt half that quantity of pepper two tablespoonfuls of vinegar three or even four of oil and a teaspoonful of chopped parsley you can vary this by putting at different times some chopped celery or pickles olives or anchovies end of chapter six chapter seven of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by aaron rivera culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter seven on frying and broiling frying is one of the operations in cookery in which there are more failures than any other or at least there appear to be more because the failure is always so very apparent nothing can make a dish of breaded cutlets on which are bald white spots look inviting or livid looking fish just flaked here and there with the bread that has been persuaded to stay on and 
Provided you have enough fat in the pan, there should always be enough to immerse the article. Therefore, use a deep iron or enameled pan. There can be but two reasons why you fail. Your fat has not been hot enough, or your crumbs have not been fine and even. Many suppose when the fat bubbles and boils in the pan that it is quite hot. It is far from being so. Others, again, are so much near the truth that they know it must become silent, that is, boil and cease to boil before it is ready, but even that is not enough. It must be silent some time, smoke, and appear to be on the point of burning, then drop a bit of bread in. If it crisps and takes color directly, quickly put in your articles. These articles, whether cutlets or fish, must have been carefully prepared, or herein may lie the second cause of failure. Any cookery book will give you directions how to crumb. Follow them. But what some do not tell you is that your bread crumb should be finely sifted. Every coarse crumb is liable to drop off and bring with it a good deal of the surrounding surface. I also follow the French plan in using the egg, and mix with it oil and water in the proportions of three eggs, one tablespoon of oil, one of water, and a little salt beat together and use. It is a good plan to keep a supply of panure or dried bread crumbs always ready. Cut any slices of baker's bread, dry them in a cool oven so that they remain quite colorless or they will not do for the purpose. When as dry as crackers, crush under a rolling pin and sift, keep in a jar for use. In no branch of cooking is excellence more appreciated than in that of frying. A dish of filets de sol or cutlets, crisp and golden brown, is an ornament to any table and is seldom disdained by any one. Apropos of filet de sol, it is very high-sounding, yet very attainable, as I shall show. I was staying with a friend early in spring, a lady always anxious for table novelties. Oh, do tell me what fish to order. I should like something fried, now that you are here to tell cook how to do it. She hasn't the wildest idea, although she would be astounded to hear me say so. Have you ever had flounders? I asked. Flounders, my friend's pretty nose went up the eighth of an inch, and her confidence in my powers as counselor went down to zero. Flounders? But they are a very common fish, you know. I know they are delicious, I answered. Order them and trust me, but I must coax the autocrat of your kitchen to allow me to cook and prepare them myself. An hour before dinner, I went into the kitchen, put at least a pound of lard into a deep frying pan, and set it to where it would get gradually hot. Then I turned my attention to the fish. They were thick, firm flounders, and ready to be cleaned, scraped, and the heads off. I then proceeded to bone one in the following way. Take a sharp knife and split the flounder right down the middle of the back, then run the knife carefully between the flesh and bones going toward the edge. You have now detached one quarter of the flesh from the bone. Do the other half in the same way. When the back is thus entirely loose from the bone, turn the fish over and do the same with the other part. You will now find you can remove the bone whole from the fish, detaching as you do so any flesh still retaining the bone. Then you have two halves of the fish. Cut away the fins, and you have four quarters of solid fish. Now see if the fat is very hot. Set it forward while you wipe your fish dry, and dip each piece in milk, then in flour. Try if the fat is hot by dropping a crumb into it. If it browns at once, put in the fish. When they are beautifully brown, which will be in about ten minutes, Take them up in the colander and lay them on a towel to absorb any fat. Lay them on a hot dish and garnish with slices of lemon, parsley, or celery tops. Now when this dish made its appearance, my friend's husband, a bon vivant, greeted it with, Aha! Filet de sol a la delimonico. And as nothing to the contrary was said until dinner was over, he ate them under the impression that they were veritable filet de sol. Of course, I can't pretend to say whether Monsieur Delmonico imports his soles or uses the homely flounder, but I do know that one of his frequenters knew no difference. Oysters should be laid on a cloth to drain thoroughly, then rolled in fine sifted cracker dust and dropped into very hot fat. Do not put more oysters in the pan than will fry without one overlapping the other. Very few minutes will brown them beautifully. If your fat was hot enough, and as a minute too long toughens and shrinks them, be very careful that it browns a cube of bread almost directly before you begin the oysters. Egg and bread crumb may be used instead of cracker dust, but it is not the proper thing, and it is a great deal more trouble. Should you be desirous of using it, however, the oysters must be carefully wiped dry before dipping them, while for cracker dust they are not wiped, but only drained well. Fish of any kind, fried in batter a la carême, 
is very easy to do and very nice. Carefully save veal, lamb, beef, and pork drippings. Keep a crock to put it in, and, clarified as I shall direct, it is much better than lard for many purposes, and for frying especially. It does not leave that dark look that is sometimes seen on articles fried in lard. The perfection of friture, or frying fat, according to Goff, is equal parts of lard and beef fat melted together. Yet, there are families where dripping is never used, is looked upon as unfit to use, while the truth is that many persons quite unable to eat articles fried in lard would find no inconvenience from those fried in beef fat. It is as wholesome as butter, and far better for the purpose. Butter, indeed, is only good for frying such things as omelets or scrambled eggs, things that are cooked in a very short time and require no great degree of heat. The same may be said of oil, than which, for fish, nothing can be better. Yet it can only be used once, and is unsuitable for things requiring long, sustained heat, as it soon gets bitter and rank. Do not be afraid to put a pound or two of fat in your pan for frying. It is quite as economical as to put less for it can be used over and over again, a pail or crock being kept for the purpose of receiving it. Always in returning to the crock, pour it through a fine strainer so that no sediment or brown particles may pass which would spoil the next frying. To clarify dripping, when poured from the meat pan, it should go into a bowl instead of the crock in which you wish to keep it. Then pour into the bowl also some boiling water and add a little salt. Stir it and set it away. Next day, or when cold, run a knife round the bowl, and, unless it's pork, it will turn out in a solid cake, leaving the water and impurities at the bottom. Now scrape the bottom of your dripping and put it in more boiling water till it melts. Then stir again, another pinch of salt add, and let it cook again. When you take off the cake of fat, scrape it as before, and it is ready to be melted into the general crock, and will now keep for months in cool weather. If you are having frequent joints, it is as well to do all your drippings together, once a week. But do not leave it long at any season with water under it, as it would taint it. Fat skim from boiled meat, pot au feu, before the vegetables, etc., go in, is quite as good as that from roast, treated in the same way. Frying in batter is very easy and excellent for some things, such as warming over meat, being far better than eggs and crumbs. Carame gives the following recipe, which is excellent. Three quarters of a pound of sifted flour mixed with two ounces of butter melted in warm water. Blow the butter off the water into the flour first, then enough of the water to make a soft paste, which beat smooth, then more warm water till it is batter thick enough to mask the back of a spoon dipped into it, and salt to taste. Add the last thing, the whites of two eggs, well beaten. Another batter, called a la Provençale, is exceedingly good, especially for articles a little dry in themselves, such as chickens to be warmed over, slices of cold veal, etc. Take some quantity of flour, two yolks of egg, four tablespoons full of oil, mix with cold water, and add whites of eggs and salt as before. Into this batter, I sometimes put a little chopped parsley and the least bit of powdered thyme or grated lemon peel or nutmeg. This is, however only a matter of taste. Broiling is the simplest of all forms of cooking and is essentially English. To broil well is very easy with little attention. A brisk, clear fire, not too high in the stove, is necessary to do it with ease. Yet if, as sometimes happen, to meet the necessities of other cooking your fire is very large, carefully fix the gridiron on two bricks or in any convenient manner to prevent the meat scorching. Then have the gridiron very hot before putting your meat upon it. Turn it, if chop or steak, as soon as the gravy begins to start on the upper side. If allowed to remain without turning long, the gravy forms a pool on the top, which, when turned, falls into the fire and is lost. The action of the heat, if turned quickly, seals the pores and the gravy remains in the meat. If the fire is not very clear, put a cover over the meat on the gridiron. It'll prevent it blackening or burning. If the article is thick, I always do so, and it is an especially good plan with birds or chickens, which are apt to be raw at the joints unless this is done. Indeed, with the latter, I think it a good way to put them in a hot oven ten minutes before they go on to broil, then have a spoonful of maitre d'hôtel butter to lay on the breast of each. Young spring chickens are sometimes very dry, in which case dip them in melted butter, or, better still, oil them all over a little while before cooking.
There is nothing more unsightly than a sprawling dish of broiled chickens. Therefore, in preparing them, place them in good form. Then, with a gentle blow of the rolling pin, break the bones that they may remain so. End of chapter 7